Christopher sailed four times across the ocean. Things didn't go as he had planned. He never found Shortcut to the Indies. Instead he found a whole new land. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean for Spain. To gain an indie shortcut that was October 12, 1492, our people in the Caribbean could not imagine that the three ships that they first saw and the ones that came in the months and years to come would completely exterminate the population of most of the islands. Our people in the, the large cities and towns on the mainland of our continent could not even imagine the death and destruction, the devastation, the holocaust throughout our continent, making their biggest impact on our cities, large towns, and large villages where the bulk of our population resided. We represent the indigenous people of this continent who have been persecuted by the Catholic Church for the last five centuries. The Catholic Church has decided to canonize a man who tortured our people, who participated in the genocide of our people, who established concentration camps on this land known as missions. Junipero Serra was no saint. He was a devil to our people. He wanted to dehumanize our ancestors. We stand here to remind the Catholic Church that you didn't kill all of us. Five percent of us survived the genocide. The church is guilty of giving an authority to the Europeans who then use the papal rules to justify genocide. There is nothing sacred about genocide. Tell that to the Jews. Tell that to the Armenians. There is nothing sacred about genocide. We are here to resist the Catholic Church and the use of white supremacy. The Catholic Church moralized genocide. There is nothing sacred about genocide. There is nothing sacred about infecting a people with smallpox purposely. There is nothing sacred about white supremacy. Who are they going to canonize next? Adolf Hitler? Who's next, Catholic Church? Are you going to canonize Adolf Hitler? Los evangelistas, Mateo, Marcos, Lucas, Juan, Padre, ¿podéis ayudarme? Creo que he olvidado los nombres. César, <risa> Carlos, Paolo, Paco, Federico, Felipe. A ver, ¿quién hará de Jesucristo? Obtendrás la gloria y la paz en el cielo, de lo contrario sufrirás un tormento eterno del infierno. En el nombre de Cristo todavía puedes salvar tu alma. Aprender la diferencia entre el cielo y el infierno. Pedirle perdón al Señor. Dios te bautizaré y obtendrás la gloria y la paz eterna en el cielo. De lo contrario sufrirás un tormento eterno en el infierno. ¿Me he entendido bien? ¿Quién cristiano es el hombre? ¿Los cristianos al cielo? Los buenos cristianos, sí. ¡Cachaguachi se infierno, man! ¡No se olvida el infierno! ¡Silencio! Esto es lo que os ocurrirá si desafiáis a los cristianos. Ya no hay, 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 ya no
Chakniko kinsi, chanta pista nini, abu ki chakta, agudos kardai ki chakta. Chakniko kinsi, chanta pista abu ki chakta, agudos kardai ki chakta. Sleepers, mostly the, the idea of, of uh, in, we're enslaved to ignorance, we're, we're chained to this uh, colonialist uh, European world, and um, the way it started is because we wanted to get this, give this idea as how, well, mostly it was really because of the, of the movement, how is it that we struggle to liberate our people or somewhat give them information or knowledge as far as, you know, like uh, the difficulty of. of, of Passing this information to, to our people, to even to our own families. Like for example, you have here, you know, why black and white? Black and white because there's no life in, in, within this colonialist world, this this world that we're we're enslaved to. And yet, that was the idea. There was really, it's really senseless. There's no color, it's, it's, as you can see. It, you know, there's gangs in in, in in our communities. There's there's poverty in our communities. There's basically cultural enslavement in our communities. And um, the idea is that once you get liberated through this, through this information of, of who we are as a people, the knowledge, the history, then light starts becoming, I mean, uh, color starts to be, becoming, uh, 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 coming into your, our lives. And that's why, you know, you got the idea of opening our eyes 
But then uh, again, we wanted to emphasize that there's also, sadly, and within our people, those that want to keep us from knowing our history. You know, and, and you could you could point out to the examples. I mean, some of us we could do we do it with our own with our own families. But that's the idea. The idea is that we're enslaved to ignorance, and this enslavement goes back all the way to 1492, obviously. But as as uh, as we learn our history, obviously we're we're, we're waking up, we're uh, coming out of our, our our slumber and 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 we're rising, little by little, and this this is is, is through the manner of knowledge, obviously manifested in books, ideas, you know, culture, awareness of who we are as a people. We're getting up slowly, we're getting out of the, our misery, our condemnation by a European colonialist world. We're getting up. The books, metaphorically, you could say, are becoming weapons. So it's in, in this transition, sadly, like as you can see, you know, someone tagged. And uh, so he's becoming the passive, you know, submissive. Yes, this is your land. Yes, I'm a mestizo. Yes, I'm a Latino. Yes, I'm a pendejo. Yes, I'm a whatever you want to call me. To a more aggressive and assertive. Nikantalaka, uh, meaning that now we know who we are as, as a people. Now we're assertive. We're saying no. We're challenging. We're saying no. This is our land. No, it's not your land. And we're becoming warriors. And we're also, obviously, in we're incorporating some history here. Here we have a uh, a Nikantalaka female, because in in our society we also had a female warriors, women. And uh, from different uh, different uh, uh, areas, different. You have a Talascalan um, with Chotzinka. You have uh, a Mixtec uh, warrior princess. We have a Zapotec uh, uh, warrior. You have a Huachotzinca warrior. You have a, 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 a the, the Mexica warrior. You have Maya warriors. You have all these warriors. But also, you saw, you see it as a, as a procession. They're becoming aware of their history. They're becoming knowledgeable. And, and that's how we are in, in essence uh, uh, as, as a movement. We're teaching, we're, we're reaching out to our people in order for them to become warriors for our people, to become educators for our people, to become the liberators of, of, of our people. The idea of how this, this, this theology came about is, is pretty, basically pretty simple. The idea was, at the beginning, obviously through observation, but before that, it was the idea of corn. Agriculture. So, from agriculture, when we had, when we, we came out of our, our sedentary life, or, 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 or you could say our life of, of abandoning a nom of the nomadic, or we became more stable through agriculture, to, through, and through ag agriculture, obviously, um, through through writing, because we had to know when to plant. But before that, we had to also know the astronomy when to plant, and. Uh, we wrote this down. We wanted to, you know, um, know uh, uh, and keep track of, of when this is going to take place. But at the same time, we were learning mathematics, and at the same time, we were basically educating ourselves. All these beautiful things just came together, and as you could tell here, it, it's the beginning of writing, the beginning of, of, of mathematics. So she's like the the first dot, the two dot, the three dot, the four. And the idea was, you know, the white, the black, and this idea was it's basically, you know, cool. And in, in, in the Mayan area, basically, the idea of, of our Creator. And what we did is we put the uh, uh, an aspect of, of the Omic because the Omic were in this area the beginners, the people who brought us our our civilization, the people who brought us the corn, the people who brought us all these ideas, and we wanted to incorporate that. So, but. What our people also did is that they wanted to tie all this uh, uh, creator, all these all these aspects together into something that we, we can relate to, something that we won't we won't forget. For example, as a Nicantalaca people. In this area over here, we show the Zapotecas. In 600 BC, we Zapotecas built Monte Alban, a pyramid city on a mountain pyramid and temples reaching to the sky. In 600 BC, we were Zapotecas. We are Zapotecas. We are each and every one of these civilizations. Here we have the Teotihuacanos. 
In 200 BC, we, Teotihuacanos, built the Pyramid of the Sun, the Pyramid of the Moon, grand boulevards, temples, palaces, art, literature, poetry, masonry, the great cities of the world. We were Teotihuacanos. We are Teotihuacanos. We are each and every one of these civilizations. In this area, we show the Maya. In 100 BC, we were the Maya, refinement in art, beauty, architecture, masters of astronomy, masters of time, masters of mathematics, builders of dozens of cities, Tikal, Copan, Palenque, Bonampak, Tulum, Chichen Itza. We were the Maya. We are the Maya. Here we have the Toltecs. In 900 AD came the Toltecs, the artists, the speakers, the golden silver makers, the book makers, the philosophers. We built the city of Tula. The Toltecs were the molders of our finer ethics, makers of our character, the embellishers of our dignity. They were the Toltecs. We were the Toltecs. We are each and every one of these civilizations. And our last great civilization was the Mexica. We Mexica built in Ostiltan, an island city and a lake with universities, botanical gardens, zoos, hospitals, the largest marketplace in the world. We Mexicas had advances in science, commerce, agriculture, and the arts. Beauty, brilliance, and genius. This was the last great of our civilizations. The idea of Europe bringing civilization to the Americas simply flips truth on its head. This is what European explorers actually found in North America. Far and away the most beautiful city on Earth. Five times the size of London or Rome. Great towers and buildings rising from the water. 60,000 gleaming houses and how spacious and how well built they were. Of beautiful stonework and cedar wood and the wood of other sweet scented trees. The many streets and boulevards of the city were so neat and well swept, despite the multitude of inhabitants, crisscrossed with a complex network of canals, like an enormous Venice, but also remarkable floating gardens that reminded of nowhere else on earth. While Europe was drinking water from its polluted city rivers, huge aqueducts transported America's water from fresh springs. But what impressed most were the special merchant areas where timber and tiles and other building materials were bought and sold, as well as green grocer streets where one could buy every sort of vegetable, fruits, honeys, nut paste and chocolates. Astonished by the personal cleanliness and hygiene of the colorfully dressed populace and by their extravagant use of soaps, deodorants and breath sweeteners. Most Europeans never bathed and kept clothes on at all times. The Pilgrim's Notes biographer Zini Finer had a terrible smell. Indians tried, quote, without success to teach them to bathe. This was construction on an epic scale. The results were awe-inspiring. A vast metropolis gleaming red and white in the jungle sun. El Mirador. Perhaps a hundred thousand people. Hundreds of great buildings. And at the eastern end of the city, the massive pyramid of Danta, possibly the largest pyramid ever built. We are told that this continent was mostly empty, that we didn't believe in owning land, that we were told savages lived in the Stone Age and without any significant accomplishments. The truth is different from these lives of small wandering tribes and empty lands. The Spanish who invaded in Mexico write of how they traveled from the coast in what is now called Veracruz up into the central part of Mexico and saw all of the land was being used for different types of agriculture. They saw five major city states that were larger than any city in Europe. They marveled at the beauty and cleanliness of these cities and of the thousands of large and small towns they passed through. Europeans wrote of their amazement upon entering Tenochtitlan, a city larger than any city in Europe. 
It was the city of the Mexica. The city of the people falsely called the Aztecs. In Tenochtitlan, they wrote of seeing restaurants, mandatory education for males and females, free hospitals, skilled doctors more advanced than any in Europe, and even public toilets, none of which existed in Europe at the time. They were especially awed by Mexica doctors and hospitals that were better than those in Europe. They wrote about the better quality of the Mexica world of medicine with pharmacies, with dentists, psychologists, and other medical specialties. They spoke of the marketplace of Tenochtitlan, which was larger than any of those of Europe. They were fascinated with the justice system that had none of the corruptions or injustices of the European legal systems. They spoke of the Mexica capital's beauty and asked themselves if they were not dreaming because they could not have imagined that such a beautiful city was even possible. The schools of today that support colonialism and media that promotes continued colonialism don't tell us that there were seven cities larger than any of the cities of Europe in 1492. all in what is now called Mexico, and Cusco and Cajamarca in what is now called Peru. We as Mica Flaca, as indigenous people of this continent, know nothing of this, and neither do the Europeans and the several nations all across our continent. We are a people of ancient civilizations. Our civilizations begin with the Galar area of Peru and in the El Porvenir area around 4700 BC. That is about 7,000 years ago. The oldest civilization in Europe that Europe claims is Mycenaean civilization of 2700 BC. But that civilization is more properly part of the civilizations of the Middle East and Egypt. All of this means that our civilizations are older than any Europe itself did not invent the wheel, nor did it invent agriculture or any writing system, nor did they invent any civilization. The things that we think today of as European, like the Latin writing system and accomplishments in the early sciences, are all from the Middle East. Greek and Roman civilizations are direct options of the Middle East. The Europeans are not truthful, even about their own history. How can we be expected to be truthful about the history of our actions on this continent? When the Spanish conquistadors first saw the Aztec city in 1519, they were amazed. There in the center of the lake was this gleaming white city it was something they had never seen before. And for us, we could almost imagine as Dorothy looking at, the, uh, you know, at Oz for the first time. It was far larger at uh, a quarter of a million people than any city they had ever seen in Europe. By the 1500s, Tenochtitlan was a teeming metropolis. It held twice the population of London or Rome. When they got closer to the city and began to walk down the causeways, they were astounded at how clean the streets were in the city. In fact, refuse was uh, taken out of the city daily. They were astounded at the uh, reuse of everything. It, they were master ecologists. The way everything was so carefully painted and ornamented and, uh, and how orderly Aztec life was. Yet America's people engineer great monuments thousands of years before the Egyptians. They map the stars with as much accuracy as any astronomer in Europe. And high on a mountain lake in Mexico, they build one of the greatest cities on the planet.
Tenochtitlan, capital of the Aztec Empire. Larger than London, Paris, or Rome. At its heart, a stone temple 100 feet high, where sky, earth, and underworld meet. The center of a civilization dedicated to human blood. The Aztecs have created one of the most sophisticated civilizations on the planet. A great city with laws against drunkenness, theft and adultery. Compulsory education three and a half centuries before the United States. A city of philosophers, poets, mathematicians. They valued art, literature, they were a very, very great civilized society. A crop that will become key to mankind's future. Corn. Six thousand years ago, early farmers in the Americas turn a weed into a cereal that produces more calories per acre than any other with almost twice as many genes as a human being. Found in a quarter of all supermarket products we buy today. No creature was so revered as the buffalo. After it was killed, it was celebrated. From the buffalo, from the earth, warriors drew strength. In visions of an animal, wolf, crow, bear, they sought guidance. In dreams of nature, snow, thunder, lightning, they found inspiration. In the world of visions, wolves spoke, thunder sang, and horses rode on clouds. We are the matriarchal Tichuan Lakota Oyate of the Osheti Shakoan, an indigenous First Nation people of Turtle Island, the continent known as North America. In togetherness with our buffalo relatives, the Tatanka Oyate, we once roamed freely across the vast prairies and hills of the Northern Great Plains until the occupation of these lands by the expanding United States Empire. Born over thousands of years, our sacred way of life taught us to live love and thrive, qualities that endure in our survival today. As we move beyond seven generations in our unyielding struggle to resist genocide, our matriarchal grandmothers are taking back their strength once again. In togetherness with Lakota warriors and people, we speak out for accountability and change to end the atrocities that keep us from healing our nation. Only by understanding our story can our people live free once again. To our relatives from the four directions, we ask you to listen, not only with your ears, but with your hearts. From the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and the place you know as South Dakota, this is our story. We did not ask you white men to come here, 
We do not want your civilization. We would live as our fathers did, and their fathers before them. In 1492, the indigenous Arawak people of the Caribbean islands encountered Christopher Columbus of Spain. Columbus wrote in his log, They would make fine servants. With 50 men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. Columbus proceeded to unleash a reign of terror unlike anything seen before. When he was finished, 8 million Arawaks, virtually the entire native population of Hispanolia, had been exterminated by torture, murder, forced labor, starvation, disease, and despair. Columbus's atrocities with cross and sword were justified by the Christian doctrine of divine discovery and set religious and legal precedent for the invasion and genocide of America's indigenous peoples for the next 500 years and beyond. By 1650, a precarious relationship between the First Nations of the East Coast of North America and New England colonists was collapsing into slaughter and enslavement of native people by settlers who wanted more land and wealth. We find that most of the English colonies sanctioned and encouraged scalping Indians. In 1776, the United States birthed the first 13 states on land taken through the ethnic cleansing of dozens of eastern seaboard tribes. The Declaration of Independence further enshrined the belief of Euro-American settler supremacy by declaring native peoples to be merciless Indian savages. In 1787, the United States adopted its constitution. Article 6 established treaties as the supreme law of the land. Despite this supreme law, treaties with sovereign native nations became slippery promises easily broken when convenient. In 1823, in the case of Johnson and Graham Lessie v. McIntosh, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that the First Nation people's right of occupancy was subordinate to the United States' divine right of discovery. The United States has unequivocally agreed that discovery gave an exclusive right to extinguish the Indian title of occupancy. This landmark ruling provided legal cover for governmental policies that would claim white Euro-Christian supremacy as justification for stealing indigenous lands and for the genocide of native peoples. In 1849, the California Gold Rush triggered the mass Western migration of settlers, putting them in direct conflict with existing indigenous nations. In 1851, anxious to protect white settlers on their way to California and to avoid a full-scale war with the Lakota and our allies, the United States requested the Treaty of Fort Laramie with the Sioux and other northern Great Plains nations. Six Sioux men signed the treaty which recognized the Lakota nation's sovereignty over a vast territory amounting to approximately 5% of the continental United States. With the end of the Civil War in 1865, the United States sent its war-hardened soldiers on a crusade to settle the West. Led by the growing dogma of manifest destiny, the U.S. claimed the God-given right to expand its borders from sea to shiny sea. Damn any man who sympathizes with Indians. I have come to kill Indians and believe it is right and honorable to use any means under God's heaven to kill them. In 1868, unable to defeat the warriors of the Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho nations fighting to protect our lands and people, for the first time in its history, the United States appealed for peace and drafted the Second Treaty of Fort Laramie. The treaty established the Great Sioux Reservation, including the Black Hills, and unceded Indian Territory to be set apart for the absolute and undisturbed use and occupation of the Indians, and that no white person or persons shall be permitted to settle upon or occupy any portion of the Indian Territory. Unable to defeat our free Lakota people with military might, the U.S. government increased the use of deceptive practices to subvert our matriarchal system and to create the appearance of agreement when our lands and rights were stolen. It is my purpose to utterly exterminate the Sioux. They are to be treated as maniacs or wild beasts and by no means as people with whom treaties or compromise can be made. J. 
just three years later in 1871, the U.S. government seeks to recognize Indian nations as sovereign and independent with the passage of the Indian Appropriation Act. This legislation legalized the theft of our treaty-protected lands and further threatened our way of life with our buffalo relatives. The civilization of the Indians is impossible while the buffalo remain upon the plains. The mass slaughter of our buffalo relatives, the Tatanko Ayate, lasted from 1871 until 1910. In just the first seven years, buffalo hunters decimated the great herds of buffalo nearly to extinction. The U.S. Army encouraged the slaughter by providing free ammunition and supplies. In 1873 alone, buffalo hunters massacred more than 1.5 million buffalo. As planned, our people became increasingly dependent on the U.S. government for even the most basic of human needs, like food, clothing, and shelter. In 1874, after illegally trespassing on Lakota territory, General George Custer publicly announced the discovery of gold in the Pahasapa, the Black Hills. As intended, the announcement unleashed a flood of miners and prospectors into the Great Sioux Reservation in violation of the 1868 Treaty. In 1875, the U.S. demanded we sell the entire Black Hills region. We refused. The U.S. declared this an act of war and launched a massive invasion of our lands to annihilate our people. Nothing short of their annihilation will get the Black Hills from them. On the 25th of June, 1876, in the Battle of the Greasy Grass, or Little Bighorn, the Sioux Nation, along with our Cheyenne and Arapaho relatives, won a great victory over General Custer and the elite 7th Cavalry. On that day, we defeated the might of the U.S. Army and took their flag. Seeking revenge for their defeat, the U.S. Army directed Colonel Randall McKenzie to unleash total war. U.S. forces went from village to village, killing women, children, and ponies, and destroying teepees, clothing, blankets, and food supplies. The U.S. then launched a sell-or-starve policy and withheld rations to coerce our people to sell the Black Hills and to relinquish our sovereign rights. These inhuman atrocities forced the surrender of many Lakota people to the U.S. agencies by spring of 1877. Despite being on the brink of starvation, few of our people signed the agreement to cede the Black Hills. When the paper was signed by Red Cloud, Spotted Tail, and others to give up the Black Hills, the majority of the Indians of the Teton Sioux tribe were not there and they never consented to giving up the Black Hills, and never gave those chiefs permission or authority to sell or give up the Black Hills. Unable to obtain the required three-fourths consent, the U.S. seized the Black Hills with an act of Congress, in violation of the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie. Incensed by the illegal seizure, negotiator for the U.S., Henry Benjamin Whipple, wrote, I know of no other instance in history where a great nation has so shamefully violated its oath. Our country must forever bear the disgrace and suffer the retribution of its wrongdoings. Our children's children will tell the sad story in hushed tones and wonder how their fathers dared so to trample on justice and trifle with God. After breaking treaties, seizing native lands, and destroying our system of life, the U.S. government introduced another element of the genocide of Turtle Island's indigenous people, assimilation. Kill the Indian, save the man. In the 1880s, the U.S. government joined forces with Christian and Catholic missionaries to steal native children, as young as two years old, from their families ship them to schools far away, burn their clothes, and cut their hair, deprive them of loving family contact for years, and use mental and physical abuse to force their assimilation into American society and the Christian religion. There are but two goals for the Indians, civilization or annihilation. 
In 1883, the U.S. created the Code of Indian Offenses to criminalize our culture and spiritual practices such as the sun dance, the giveaway, gifts for the bride, feasts, and medicine men. Punishments included fines, hard labor, imprisonment, and withheld rations. In 1885, the U.S. Congress continued its assault on tribal sovereignty by passing the Major Crimes Act which unilaterally extended U.S. jurisdiction over major crimes into sovereign Lakota territory. In 1887, the U.S. Congress approved the General Allotment Act to divide communal land of the Great Sioux Reservation into individual parcels of privately owned property assigned to tribal members. Our people had no concept of individual ownership of our Mother Earth. The Indian must be imbued with the exalting egotism of American civilization so that he will say I instead of we and this is mine instead of this is ours. Two years later in 1889, in violation of the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie, the U.S. Congress passed an act to divide the Great Sioux Reservation into five separate and smaller reservations, including the Pine Ridge Reservation. The U.S. government opened the remaining 11 million acres of Sioux Treaty territory for public purchase, including sacred sites and burial grounds our people used for thousands of years. Having wronged them for centuries, we had better, in order to protect our civilization, follow it up by one more wrong and wipe these untamed and untamable creatures from the face of the earth. By 1890, our Lakota people, once powerful and free, were entirely dependent on the U.S. government. The U.S. had forcibly removed our people from our homeland, confined them to reservations, cut their rations by half, stolen our children, and decimated the great herds of our buffalo relatives. On the 29th of December, 500 soldiers of the U.S. Army's 7th Cavalry Regiment surrounded Bigfoot's band of about 350 Lakota people at Wounded Knee Creek, and along with four rapid-fire Gatling guns, massacred 312 of our men, women, and children. Our people know Wounded Knee as a massacre. The U.S. government calls it a battle. 23 U.S. troops were awarded the Medal of Honor. Something else died here in the bloody mud and was buried in the blizzard. A people's dreams died here. It was a beautiful dream. The nation's hoop is broken and scattered. There is no center any longer, and the sacred tree is dead. In 1903, the U.S. Supreme Court decision Lone Wolf v. Hitchcock secured U.S. hedge money over indigenous peoples by granting Congress unlimited authority to break Indian treaties unilaterally to sell treaty-protected land and to regulate all aspects of Indian affairs without the consent of indigenous nations. In 1934, President Franklin D. Roosevelt and the U.S. Congress passed the Indian Reorganization Act, the IRA. In a misguided attempt to fix the indigenous nations the U.S. deliberately had broken. Despite opposition from traditional elders and in violation of the 1868 treaty, John Collier, Commissioner of Indian Affairs, and Harold Ix, Secretary of Interior, illegally approved the IRA Oglala Sioux Tribal Council and Constitution for the Pine Ridge Reservation with the support of only 1,348 tribal members out of an estimated 12,000 Oglala Lakota people. Most of our people were ineligible, unable, or unwilling to cast a vote. In the 1960s and 70s, U.S. Indian Health Services, IHS, physicians performed involuntary sterilizations on thousands of Lakota women aged 15 to 44. 
IHS facilities singled out full-blood Lakota women for sterilization procedures. On the 27th of February, 1973, 300 American Indian movement activists from more than 75 tribes began occupying Wodini, the site of the massacre 83 years earlier. Traditional elders from Pine Ridge sought to exercise our people's natural right to sovereignty and to take a stand against the corruption of the illegal Oglala Sioux tribe government. Continuing the 150-year war on the Lakota people, federal authorities escalated the occupation of Wounded Knee into armed conflict with a force of U.S. Marshals, FBI agents, National Guard personnel, armored personnel carriers mounted with machine guns, snipers and helicopters, semi and fully automatic assault rifles, grenade launchers, tear gas, jets for aerial photographs, and paramilitary personnel. The occupation ended after 71 days when a local Lakota man was killed by a federal sniper and both sides agreed to disarm. From 1973 to 1976, in the aftermath of the Wounded Knee takeover, the U.S. government backed Oglala Sioux Tribe President Dick Wilson and his guardians of our Oglala Nation paramilitary vigilante force, nicknamed Goons, inflicted the reign of terror on Pine Ridge. More than 60 grassroots activists, traditional full-blood Lakota people, and our supporters were assassinated. 300 were harassed and beaten. 562 were arrested, of which only 15 were convicted of crimes. During that time, the murder rate on the Pine Ridge Reservation soared to 170 per 100,000, the highest in the world at that time. In 1980, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the 1877 seizure of the Black Hills was illegal, but did not return the land to our people, offering money instead. To this day, we refuse to accept the monetary compensation offered for the theft of sacred Bahasapa. In 2000, at a ceremony acknowledging the 175th anniversary of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Assistant Secretary of the BIA, Kevin Gover, admitted, from the very beginning, the Office of Indian Affairs was an instrument by which the United States enforced its ambition against the Indian nations and the Indian people who stood in its path. It must be acknowledged that the deliberate spread of disease, the decimation of the mighty bison herds, the use of the poison alcohol to destroy mind and body, and the cowardly killing of women and children made for tragedy on a scale so ghastly that it cannot be dismissed as merely the inevitable consequence of the clash of competing ways of life. Though he described the multitude of ways the U.S. government has devastated indigenous peoples and nations, he failed to admit the truth. Genocidal warfare continues today. This is a white man's country. This is a white man's world. The white man from Europe dominates the whole planet. White men go into any country and kill everybody take over anything they want. This is a white man's country. It's a white man's world. White people out of Europe have dominated Europe, and Europe has dominated the world. And so England has manipulated and exploited the races, the peoples of the world. The white man has been using uh, exploitation, commerce, to manipulate and exploit the whole human race. And one way that we counter-protested the Minutemen was to try to reframe the whole issue of immigration. It's like, okay, you want to talk about immigration? We'll talk about immigration. But not the way you want to talk about it. We'll talk about it how it is from 1492 forward, who the real immigrants are. And so that was kind of what our approach was to them, you know. They like to use the term amnesty and anchor babies as some kind of insult against us, when in fact they are the anchor babies. They came here, they stayed here, and that's just giving them the credit of saying that they're immigrants. Because are they really immigrants is the question. Let's just say I wanted to immigrate to Europe. So I go out into the countryside of France, find a little chateau, fields, and I'm like, oh, this is a nice place. I think I'll immigrate here, or emigrate here. So I go knock on the door, go up to the house, the guy invites me in, gives me some cheese, gives me some wine or whatever. And then uh, 
So I said, yeah, I think I'll stay here. So I kill him, bury him in the backyard. I uh, decide to, uh, to move in and, s and sleep with his wife. You know, I drive his car. I spend his money. Am I an immigrant or am I a criminal? That's what, that's what they did when they came here in 1492. They didn't come as immigrants. They came to steal the land, plain and simple. There's none of this uh, religious freedom nonsense. You know, they came here specifically to steal the land, to steal the resources. And if that meant they had to kill Indians in the process, they had no problem with doing that. But I'm going to start by defining immigration. Uh, immigration is defined as the act of immigrating to come to a country of which one is not a native. And then migration is defined as the process or act of migrating to pass periodically from one region to another. And that's very, very important to understand because we as a people have a history of over 30,000 years on this continent. And during that time, we migrated south throughout the whole length North America, Central America, South America. But it wasn't a one-time migration. We also migrated back up, back down again, across and over. So we filled up the whole continent. Uh, we've all heard that expression, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. But when you take a step back and you look at the bigger picture, it's more than just that one border. Because when a lot of people say that, they mean this border. But in actuality, the border didn't cross us just here. It crossed us here, here, of course, here, 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 I can keep going. What I was trying to say with all that is that before the Europeans arrived in 1492, we as a people did not, or what should I say, not confined to what the borders are today, these European borders, and this immigration thing, why Europeans weren't immigrants. Uh, one thing that they complain about is that we come here to this country and we don't assimilate. And then, uh, you know, one of my favorite protests was about a year ago, we went down to San Diego and Manuel confronted Lou Dobbs face to face. And he asked Lou Dobbs, he said, well, how come when you came here, your people didn't assimilate? How come you didn't learn our languages? You know, how come you didn't uh, learn our theology? All the questions. Why? Why? Why didn't your ancestors assimilate? Why didn't your? And Lou Dobbs was like, what do you mean? He tried to play stupid. Maybe he wasn't playing. I don't know. So I'm just gonna like, kind of wrap this up by, uh, you know, it was like I said, it was very brief. But you know, when you start looking at this whole issue of immigration and migration, not in their terms, but in the terms of us having a 50,000 year, 30,000 year history on this land of moving around without observing these European borders that are here now, you know that we have the right to migrate everywhere and anywhere on our continent. You know, nobody can tell us where we can and cannot go. My favorite line is, we didn't observe their borders in 1492. Why do we need to observe them in 2009? And I'm going to pass the floor back to Noyolo.